Hey crew, it's Ben, and I'm back with another Bible study. Today we're going to be getting back into Exodus, but before we do, if you are unsure or unclear of what I am doing here in, in this Bible study, you should probably start at the beginning because I have some very unconventional beliefs and I would hate for your feelings to get hurt. The links will be provided up above. Now, well, we're going to dive back into Exodus. We are in Exodus 17 because we left off in Exodus 16. and We are doing a line-by-line, -line, word word-by-word reading from the Bible. If something strikes us as unusual, we will look it up, we will pop it out, we will see what's going on. We're in Bible Hub for that reason. It is really easy to check different versions. It is different, easy to check the original source of words. It's easy to get cross-referencing. It's easy to use Bible Hub to do the research that you need to understand what is going on in the Bible. And so that's why I use the resource. I know a lot of people get stuck on certain versions being the only version, but I am here to tell you they're all wrong. And so we're going to get into Exodus 17. In Exodus 16, we left off with the maggot bread from heaven. And if you collected this very, very, very thin bread that had to take an extreme effort to go in, like, to go and harvest enough frost to eat and be fill up a jar has to take a lot of effort. It really does. And so it seems like maybe God could have helped them out with a little bit of size there. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's just me being picky. But this God that they are serving does not seem to be an all-powerful, all-helpful God. He told them, why are you bothering me? Why are you coming to me with this? You handle this. When they were standing in front of the mountain of Baal, trying to get the water to move out of the way. He said, y'all handle this water situation. Well, now we have another water situation. The tribe is wandering through the desert, and now they're out of water. And we don't know why, right? We're in Exodus 17, which is the second book of the Bible, and it doesn't let us know why, but they, they can't find water. And then the whole congregation of Israel left the desert of sin, moving from place to place as the Lord commanded. We did the desert of sin in the last video. There's a lot of deserts in the area, and so... They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink, so the people contended with Moses, give us water to drink. Now, the contended here is kind of wrestled with and struggled with, so it's not that big of a deal, but it says, why do you contend with me, Moses replied, why do you test the Lord? Is it testing the Lord to ask for water? Is it testing the Lord, who has promised to bring you to a land of milk and honey, like, not in 40 years, but right away, you're being given a land. Right away, as you were taking out of slavery, even though you're brought well out of the way, right? There was a little passage that you could have brought these three million, pe three, <laughs> three million people and just taken the land. That, that, that could have happened, but no, 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 no. This flaming thing brought you down here to the front of the mountain of Baal. And you crossed the waters and there was a sacrifice that was made. That happened instead of you just taking the land. And now you're wandering through the desert. You're kind of pissed off. Because you were promised freedom. You were promised milk and honey. And God has not delivered. That's a problem. I know people don't think it is. Because, well, they're going to be given Israel later. That was not the deal that God made for them. At this point, they are freshly out. They haven't had time to sin and pick up no new religions or any of that. They could have been brought straight to the promised land. If God that they serve was faithful and true, he could have delivered them the land right away. And there is no reason to expect that he would not have. There is no reason to believe that because they needed a redemptive ark later, that they had to not get this now. They were promised a land of milk and honey by God with lands that they did not settle, that houses they didn't build, fields that they did not till, and orchards that they did not plant. That is their promise, that they are going to go and take everything from another people. That is the promise being given by the God here, and it's not even fulfilled. Sit on that for just a second, and now, now you're in the desert. You aren't going to the desert. You were in the land of Goshen. You were doing all right as a slave. It was terribly oppressive. Probably. Like any slavery to me is terribly oppressive. But 
the, the way it was described was terribly oppressive because they were detested and they were loved and they were detested and they were loved. And there's a whole whatever going on there. And they've got the whole best part of Egypt belongs to them, whatever. And they're, they're slaves. And then now they're wandering through the desert and they don't have water. And we don't know why. But the people thirsted for water there and they grumbled against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? That is not an invalid question. Why should we have followed you at this point? Yes, we have been delivered. Okay, I'm not going to argue that, right? Because I've already argued the deliverance. And so we have been delivered. They should be perfectly fine with faith. But their God should be faithful. They should not be running out of water. And then Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? A little more, and they will stone me. That's interesting. Right? You've got three million really mad people because they can't drink. And it's not even like me that can't drink. My kids don't have anything to drink. That is a big deal to parents. If you're not a parent, you may not know, but I'm here to let you know. Like, I will thirst to death while my child drinks, but if my child ain't got nothing to drink, we're going to find it. And the Lord said to Moses, Walk on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you and take along in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. And behold, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, and when you strike the rock, water will come out of it for people to drink. All right, so before we get to the conclusion of this, we're going to jump over to the rest of the story. And we're going to go to Numbers 20, because this is the rest of the story. And in the first month, the whole congregation of Israel entered the wilderness of Sin and stayed in Kadesh. And there, Miriam died and was buried. Now remember, I think it was the last one, it might have been the one before, but I told you that Miriam was going to be a problem. Because... Miriam is a prophetess, and in Judaism, women are not allowed to hold public office, or religious office most especially, at the point, that point in time. I'm not sure about now, probably the same now though, but back then, for sure. And so Miriam, being a prophetess, is a problem for the religions. And I mean, you know, the two at this point, right? We left the one behind at Abraham, but now we have two, and both of these have a really big problem with the fact that this prophetess was the one supplying the water. Well, if she was the one supplying the water, I wonder who really did the deal at the, at the mountain. And if this prophetess, Miriam, Mary, if she is the one who moved the waters and brought the waters and manipulated the waters, then what was God even doing, right? The, the God here, like, we've talked. And so, now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered against Moses and Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished with our brothers before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you let us out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? Is it, is it not a place of grain, figs, vines, or pomegranates? And there's no water to drink? That is what they were promised, right? A place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates. That's what they were promised. And what did they get? Nothing to drink. What has their God given them? Nothing to drink. They're following through a desert with three million people. Like That is an act of faith. Why is God not being faithful here? Why is God not automatically providing them with water? Well, that is a major problem for these religions. It really is. It is another one of those contradictions and another one of those inconsistencies that just don't add up in the grand scope of things unless you apologize for it. Unless you say that later on, this is going to be justified because of these things that have to happen later on. Well, that doesn't, no, no. 
this right here is God not being true to his people. But what I'm saying is that maybe the God they are serving is not the God of truth. And so, then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting. Wait a second. They fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The tent of meeting, right? We'll probably get into that when we get into Numbers, but in Exodus, we don't have that. In Exodus, we don't have any of the ceremonial things that go at all to do with any of this. Right? In the, the definition book, you have Genesis that defines how the race was created, and then you have Exodus, which defines who the people are. And in that book, the book that defines who the people are, like you get next is the book of Numbers, or Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and then Numbers. So next you get Deuteronomy, which is the book of Generations, which tells you the, the history of all the people. And then you get the book of Numbers, which between Deuteronomy and Numbers is the books of laws, right? Which is lays down this is the thing to do. And so why in the book of defining who the peoples are do we not have that? Because it doesn't work. <laughs> and so if we were to have here at this point a tent of meeting, then we should have had in, in Exodus a tent of meeting as well. They should have went to the tent of meeting, but they didn't. Right? Because it didn't exist yet. But here, in this part of the story, it does. And so they, they, just, they just throw the two together. Like, it's supposed to just meld because. No, you left out details. They fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will pour out its water, and you will bring out water from the rock and provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. You will bring out water from the rock. You will bring out water from the rock. Let's go ahead and pop that out real quick. We're going to go ahead and see... Some of these others right here. You will bring out the water. You will provide enough water. Uh, right here. Then you shall bring out water. You and your brother Aaron go out on the thing. And you will bring out water. King James. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rocks. None of these says God's about to do it, right? Bear that in mind when we get to Israel. Bear in mind... They, God himself told Moses that you will bear the water out of the rock. When we get to Israel, when we get to taking the land, and Moses is denied entry by God for saying that he brought water from the rock. Because who told him to say that? Inconsistencies. These problems are problems. And then Moses said, and so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had been commanded. Again, this is, this is Miriam's staff. I know that that steps on toes, but this is one of those nuggets of truth that just happened to slide in and everybody just happens to gloss over. I don't know that, Aaron, that Moses and Aaron did a damn thing. I think Miriam had a lot to do with how they got away with what they did. And maybe this staff was taken from the priest of Midian, who was the father-in-law of Moses, right? And where he lived for 40 years and learned these tricks. And maybe he did do that. And maybe it was Miriam. Because once Miriam disappeared, so did the water. And then Moses raised his hand and uh, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, this, Listen now, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, so that a great amount of water gushed out, and the congregation and their livestock were able to drink. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I had given them. Bullshit. 
These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and he showed his holiness among them. What I'm telling you here, right here, right now, is that this whole situation right here, where they go to God, and he's like, you handle it. Why are you coming to me with this? Okay, fine. If, if, based on nothing else alone, you get to the point where you're leading these people through the desert and there's no water, and if you going to your God to ask for water is too much for him, you are serving the wrong God. If that is too much for him to be able to keep his promises to you for doing faithfully what he has asked you to do, then maybe... You are doing the wrong thing. Maybe you are serving the wrong God. And this is an instance of God not being faithful and true. This right here is God not fulfilling his promise. And you can believe what you want about the character and content of God. But I believe that God is not, not the God that's going to do that. The God that I serve, the one that created all things and wants everybody to succeed and do well and be repentful and follow in his ways, that God is going to hold to his promises for the guy who has done the thing that he asked him to do. The guy with a stutter who saw a bush and went and rescued three million people. I think it's going to be okay that he came and asked me for some water for three million people. Since I told him to go get these three million people. And we didn't bring them to the land of milk and honey. Where they were promised grain and figs and vines and pomegranates. We didn't bring them there. We brought them to the desert of sin. We brought them to the middle of the wilderness in the heat with no water. I think it's okay if they ask for water. I think that God would say it's okay if they ask for water. And these were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and he showed his holiness among them. Yeah, holiness. That's what the word is. There's a, there's a word in front of that holiness, maybe. Maybe it's ass holiness. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> I know, I'm pissing people off, but that's kind of what I do. Like, I never set out to intentionally hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want anybody ever to think that I do. That's why I give the warning before I start for you to check it out at the top because if you just stumble across this, it can be shocking. It can definitely be shocking, and I understand that. But the thing is is that if we don't discuss this, then it just continues, and it is past time for this continuing. And then so Moses, we're back in Exodus. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he named the place Massah or Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? And now we're going to get into this because we've talked about the water. We've talked about God being unfaithful and untrue and not keeping his promises. And now we're going to talk about one more instance of that. In the same book, in the same chapter, before we even end it. The defeat of the Mechalites. Now, this right here is the beginning of an enormous enormous feud. We will be seeing the Omechalites for a while. And so, I want to point out that this is the beginning, right? Because there is a war coming that will feature these people. The Omechalites, let me go ahead and pull up Google Earth. So y'all are just going to have to bear with me for a second while it pops up. Oh, uh, we're going to show you where they're at. What is going on? Oh, it's because it's got static on it. Let me take that off. Bam, bam, bam. All right. So, the Amalekites are a people that control a significant portion of the desert. Right? We are here. We are right here. And we're going to be popping back over into numbers because this is related to the same thing. But Edom is Jordan, right here. Midian is this area right here, right? 
And this whole section right here is the Amechalites. How far out into this desert? It's a little iffy, but this entire desert right here belongs to these people, the Amechalites. The desert of sin is here, right? Possibly here, but uh, this general area is the desert of sin. And Sinai is right up in here, Jabal el Abbas. And this is where I believe Sinai is. This is where we will see later the Amechalites. We're on the back side of Sinai, on the east side right here. And uh, they are gathered below the mountain. They don't say that quite yet. When we no, that was the wrong page for sure. But <laughs> uh, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. All right, so Rephidim is probably right here. I'm not sure exactly. History's not sure exactly. We've shown many times how there is plenty of reason to not believe that. But this is the area I believe that they were wandering with no water. This is the area. The Amalekites controlled, and I believe that Rephim is in this area. All right, now let me go ahead and close this out so I don't accidentally open it again. Oh, after this, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, who we don't even know about yet, "Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on the hilltop with the staff of God in my hand." And so Joseph. Joshua did as Moses had instructed him and fought against the Amalekites, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. But when he lowered them, Amalek prevailed. And when Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on each side, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. And so, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek with his army, and his army with a sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll, as a reminder, and recite it to Yeshua, because I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. Now, one thing to note that I didn't get into is that this word right here is the exact same word as Jesus. Yeshua and Yahshua, same thing. Now, you can argue whatever you want. I don't care. It's the same name used for both of these people. Take from it what you will. But write it on a scroll and recite it to Joshua. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. When? Because it's not happened. You know how I know it hasn't happened? Because it's in the book. If it's in the book, it's not blotted out the memory of. If you write it down, then you're continuing the memory of. And so, you can say, well, in prophecy, in 6,000 years, when he comes back and he reforms the earth, then all the Amalekites will be gone. And okay, okay, if that's what you want. You're not going to be comfortable here. This is another instance throughout generations to come whenever God hasn't fulfilled this promise. If they had overwhelmed Amalek and his army with the sword and took them out, then they should have just took them out and gotten rid of them and blighted them from the land like they did with people later. They had an army of 600,000 fighting men. But they didn't. And now we're going to jump back in here and we're going to look at Edom. Uh, real quick, just because this has to bear with the, the, the fight that we just set down. Now, Amalek is here, right? Midian is over here by the Gulf of Akba. But Jordan is pretty much like, uh, is, is pretty much the, the entire area that we're talking about, Edom. And so from Kadesh, Moses sent out messengers to tell the king and of Edom. This is what your brother Israel says. You know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt 
where we lived many years. The Egyptians mistreated us and our fathers, and when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice, sent an angel, and brought us out of Egypt. Now look, we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please, let us pass through your land. We will not cut through any field or vineyard and drink water or drink water from any well. We will stay on the king's highway and we will not turn to the right or the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom answered, You may not travel through our land or we will come out and confront you with the sword. We will stay on the main road, the Israelites replied, and if we, we or our herds drink your water, we'll pay for it. There will be no problem. Only let us pass through on foot. But Edom insisted, you may not pass through. And they came out to confront the Israelites with a large army and a strong hand. And so Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through their territory, and Israel turned them away. Alright, so we're going to go back over here. We're not going to get into Exodus 18, because Exodus 18 brings us into Jethro and the receiving of the law from man. Yeah, the judges and the law from man. And so, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up, uh, talking about the geography again for just a second. The reason I wanted to bring up the, the point about Edom is, Edom denied them passage from the desert of sin. We're going to assume Kadesh is in this area. This is a, a trade route, runs through here, right? Petra is right up in here. Uh, somewheres, which is one of the oldest trade routes in the history of the world. It's quite possibly one of the arc points. And so, oh, they were trying to receive passage from Midian into Israel so that they could conquer Israel. And Edom knew that and said no. Because these people are the people of Abraham who had tricked their way into wealth prior to. Who had lived in this land and deserted it. They ran off and left the promised land because their God could not fulfill his promises. And so they ran off to another people's land. And now... Every firstborn child and all the livestock and all the crops in that land are dead. Now, you can say natural plagues, you can say judgments of God, but that is what has happened. And what the people over here in Edom are going to hear about well before they make their trip all the way through this desert and around here and all this, right? Egypt sending runners out this way to look for them to begin with because that's where they thought they were going. That's why they went south. That's why they had to cross the Red Sea, because they were cowards, and their God could not provide for them. And so, like, if you, the, how can you say that God called you for, to freedom and then take, like, this trip here? Let's, let's do the measurement, right? Let's go ahead and do the measurement. Say they were taking from the eastern edge of the, of, of the, the blessed part here. That's only 130 miles. To the south, southern edge of the green part. That is a lot less desert to go through. As opposed to going all the way down this way. Now, we've talked before about how they came. I think they came down this way. But they may not have. They may have come down this way and over this way. Right? That makes sense. If they would have skipped the Gulf of Suez and come down this the eastern side of the Gulf of Suez instead of the western side then they only had to cross this gulf. This is the Red Sea that they got done. Well, that puts a whole different spin on that, that mountain of God, doesn't it? The mountain of Baal <laughs> that we could probably almost see from here. Right over there. And so, maybe this was where they crossed the Red Sea. Maybe it was at the Gulf of Aqua. Maybe it was just right here. That makes sense. They could they could more than likely see this from... Now, that's not saying that is exactly what happened. This is all speculation. I understand that. My point is, is that God has not been faithful to these people. 
These people have not been worthy of God's faithfulness. We have not seen, with very few exceptions, of worthy people in the nation. Right? Joseph was a good dude. He was good. Enoch was a good dude. I don't know. But that's it. Like, we haven't seen anybody since Abraham, other than Joseph, that's really somebody God would get down with. Somebody that God would bless. All the 12 tribes are named by horrible things. It doesn't, yeah, whatever. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion. I know, I know, I know I'm stepping on toes. I really wish there was another way to do it, but there's not. I really wish there was another way to do it than to just read it and show you how it is blatantly inconsistent with itself. How it blatantly contradicts itself from the nature of God. Is it really too much to ask for water in the desert. And if it is, are you serving the right God? That is the question that you should be asking. That is the thing that you should be figuring out. That is what I'm trying to show here, is that I really don't think it is. I really think everything went wrong at Abraham. I really think that the God that is being served since that point is the wrong one. And we really need to get back to the right one. Hopefully I didn't bring too much confusion, right? Hopefully this is bringing enlightenment to the crew. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you were here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. You're perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. <laughs> this has been Pitt State. Peace.